Timothy Ballard is founder and CEO of Operation Underground Railroad, or OUR. He also serves as OUR's jump team commander for rescue operations. Grateful to have you here. Thank you. It's great broke to be here. up a major sex trafficking ring in Colombia, which has become a destination for tourists looking for sex with boys and girls. The police had help from an American who went undercover to rescue the children, and Elaine Quijano met him. Tim Ballard has one mission, to track down child traffickers. Four months ago, Colombian authorities asked him to investigate a tip that children were being sold there as sex slaves. Within a half hour, this individual walks up to me, starts asking me what I'm here for, what I want, and within m minutes, he says, well, I've got, I've got kids as young as 11 years old. Ballard, a former Homeland Security agent, now heads up Operation Underground Railroad, a nonprofit group that rescues trafficked kids. After that first meeting, the Colombians asked him to put together a sting. No men will be in here, only women. Operation Underground Railroad spent months planning, renting this house, rigging it with hidden cameras to document the crime, coordinating with Colombian authorities, and negotiating with the traffickers. How they find these kids is they lure them in by pretending to have a modeling agency. They target them at 9 or 10 years old. And they were telling us that about by 11, they're ready for sex. They're ready to be sold. What is that like looking into that kind of person's eyes? It, it, it's horrifying, and this is why. Because I've got a smile in the face of evil. This is the table where we're going to do the negotiation. Less than 24 hours after the operatives landed, the suspected traffickers arrived on the island, and the final deal with the undercover team began. 54 boys and girls aged 11 to 18 were ushered in for what had been billed as a sex party. They were given candy and drinks and told to wait in this small room. This, this little 11 year old boy, I remember, he asked one of my operatives if they could give him some cocaine or something. That they, he said, they usually give me something because I'm really scared. By the time the deal was done, the alleged traffickers were set to make $25,000. That transaction was never completed. 25 Colombian special operatives stormed the party, arresting five suspects, four men, and one former beauty queen, all charged with child trafficking. The victims, 29 of whom are under 18, were evacuated, given medical exams, and placed in a rehabilitation center where specialists are working to undo the damage. Right before I got in the boat, we had to walk by the, this room where the kids were, and they put their hand up. And I touched their hand and see that there's liberation now. Liberating one child at a time. Elaine Quijano, CBS News, New York. One of the first things I wanted to ask you was, I think a lot of people here, including myself, um, you know, we hear child slavery, child trafficking, and it's maybe new to us, maybe new to some people listening in. Can you give us a sense of just how big uh, this epidemic is around the world and what you've seen? Yeah, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's shocking how big it is. Um, if I wasn't in this, I wouldn't believe it. Um, but then the numbers are staggering. I mean, it's, there are more people, if you look at men, women, and children, there's more people in slavery today than ever before in the history of the world. And it's, you know, it's interesting because we kind of congratulate ourselves, I think, as a, as a people that we have eradicated slavery. And that was all back in the old days. There's more people in, enslaved today than, than you can add up all the people that were enslaved uh, during the transatlantic slave trade, for example. And, and in no way am I belittling that. I mean, that was a horrific and just terrible. Um, there's more living today than, than all of those over 300 years. Um, and... and uh, Millions of them are children. By most estimations, over five million children are forced into sex slavery or slave labor. And uh, roughly two million are, are children forced into sex slavery. So the, the, these numbers are astronomical. It's how can this possibly be uh, until you go in? And, I, and I've been in there. And I see this is, this is real. Mm -hmm. These children you just saw on the, on the clip. I mean, that's one of, of countless operations we, we've done. This is real. Kids are being sold 
uh, a sex slave, a slave labor. It is, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's the most horrific plague ever to hit the earth, and, and, and especially in our time. And part of what we're trying to do is let people know, because most people don't know. It'll never be eliminated until everybody knows and stands up. Can you kind of take us through, you know, in the CBS um, introduction, it kind of mentioned your initial background in, in the CIA and Homeland Security. Can you walk us through the creation of OUR and, and how you came about? Yeah, it was, uh, I didn't go into this thing with my you know, sword unsheathed and courageously. I was scared to death of this topic. I didn't want to. I didn't want to see it any more than any, anyone wants to see it, um, but um, I was asked to do it, and I, and, I, and I did, and then I saw, and I couldn't, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and I, I applaud the U.S. government's efforts um, leading the way, I believe, in, in this fight, especially Homeland Security Investigations, the group I worked with, and uh, just, just great programs they're, they're pushing out. The reason I created Operation Underground Railroad was really... Um, um, a couple of cases, one in particular ha had to do with a little boy who I learned about um, in Haiti who had been kidnapped and trafficked. And I, I learned about this case and I couldn't, st I, I was kind of just obsessing over it. Like, well, who's looking for this little boy? It was this, this one little child, I had a picture of him on my desk. Um, I learned about it, I, I read it, there was an article in the, in the paper that I had found about this case. And I got to the point where I, it wasn't a U.S. case. There was, the crime happened in Haiti, the crime happened in Haiti, the crime happened in Haiti. And so there was no mandate, there was no budget for the U.S. government to get involved in, in this situation. I met the father, his, his name is Gesno. I actually had some friends fly him up uh, to where I was so we could sit down and go through the whole case and find out if there's something we could do. And. He, one of the very first things he said to me, super humble, amazing man, um, he said, do you have children? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, can you imagine, can you imagine going to bed knowing that one of your children's bed was empty, that they were, your child was not there and you didn't know where they were, could you go to sleep? And I said, there's no way I could go to sleep. And he says, I haven't slept for years. And he went on to tell me that he would, his investigative technique was, he was on his own. I mean, he's, he's in one of the poorest nations on the planet. Um, very little resources to be doing any kind of proactive investigations into missing children or kids who had been trafficked. And he knew his child had been. So he just arbitrarily would pick a neighborhood in, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and just walk and hope he would hear his child cry. And that's, that's what he was doing. And I, and I was I was in tears, he was in tears. I said, guess what? This is, there's better ways to do this. He's like, well, show me. I don't know what to do. All I know is I have to do something. And then I recognized, well, then I promised him. I said, I, I will do everything I can. And then I realized the only way for me to help him would be to leave the government and go about this privately so that we can work in Haiti today and in Thailand tomorrow and the United States the next day and to, to not have a uh, jurisdictional kind of restrictions and go immediately to, 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 to the problem and work with law enforcement to help them. And we always work with law enforcement. We don't go around, and we're not a vigilante group. And so we, we, we dug into that case. That was our first case. We, we met with the Haitian police and they opened the investigation back up. They, uh, they gave us the legal um, uh, requirements that, that we needed to work under their authority. And we were able to, we, we haven't found the little boy yet. Um, but we were able to find where he was, and we were able to pull 28 children out from the place he was and put a couple people, a couple people behind bars who were selling kids. And so we, we, we got those kids out, and that's led to further opportunity for us to, to, to find this little boy, Guardy, where, where we feel we're close. And, um, it, but it just, it just shows how many Guardies are there, how many guests know the father, how many are, there's millions of these people. And you know, we go about our lives Especially here in this in this nation, most of us are feeling pretty protected by the laws, and we go about our lives and to, and to think that there's millions of people who are suffering that. Uh, it just. We, 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 we. Gesno is an amazing man. What he does for a living is he helps children. He runs one of the most successful orphanages in Haiti. 
Hundreds of kids come in and he seeks homes for them. The children there, they are happy. They love him. He's a father figure to them. In fact, ironically, the reason his son was kidnapped was because he was so successful at building an orphanage that people mistakenly believed he was a rich man. All of us are convinced involved in Haiti. They're still there, but where? The last time somebody thought they saw Gardi was in La Calle, right? Yes. So he might, he could be there. Yeah, he could be there, he could be in Popo still. Hidden somewhere. So it was the nursery class that he was taken out of? No, no, I would, no, it's after the church we were taken out. It's after church? Mm -hmm. Kids running around? Yes. Members are seeing each other, you know, then is it. I spent the whole church meeting with him on my laps, you know, on my, in my arms. I was teaching a lesson that day, and after the sacrament, and I just let him go to, to the mom, to the mother. You know, and I waited for about five or 10 minutes, you know, talking to members. So when we were ready to go, my wife came back and said, where's Cody? I said, look, he's he wrong with you. I said, no. Then it happened. I went to the police reporting that, you know, we've lost a child. 35 minutes later, I went to another police department. Then my phone rang. The call came anonymous, you know. Then I hung up. Then they called me back immediately. Then I see the number. I told to the police officer, I said, look, there's a number that I know, just called me and asked me money for the child that I've just told you that I have lost. How much money did they ask? 150,000 American dollars they asked me first. And what happened with that? Did, did, you, well, did you try to get the money? Well, well, I give them about one, I give them 150 Haitian goods, which is about, at that time, 4,500 American dollars. I paid as a ransom. I paid that money on two occasions. They never returned the child. And they just, and they didn't deliver? No. You know, um, and as you watch the film, you see we actually infiltrate the organization that was responsible for the, the kidnapping and trafficking of Guardian. We end up, he's not there, but we end up liberating 28 other children uh, who were being sold. And they're being sold for sex trafficking, for slave labor, for organ harvesting. And I know I'm, I'm looking in the audience now and I, and I see the, 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 the expression that I feel in my heart as well, of just, just broken and you're watching this and you're thinking what, what, what is going on? And I, and I, I apologize to all watching this because it's so dark. And, and I also don't apologize um, uh, because if we, if we don't see it, these kids won't be liberated. We have the ability because of where we are and, and, and who we are and, and the, the blessings we've been given, we have the ability to help. Um, and there's, there's millions of guardies. That's, that's the heartbreaking thing. This is just one, one story. Um, and so it's important that we see some of this darkness so that we can rise up and, and, um, and really we bring light. In, in fact, when we rescued those 28 kids, I went back to Gesno and uh, it was like this bittersweet experience. I'm like, oh my gosh, we, we got these kids out. Three guys are in jail now. Um, these kids are safe, but, but Gaudi wasn't there. He thought Gaudi would be there. We thought, we were hoping Gaudi would be there. And, he, and this is in the film, you, see, you remember you see his kind of blank expression and he's kind of shocked and then he immediately says, well, how are those kids doing? Where are the kids? The other kids. Um, and then off camera, they didn't get this. I said, I'm so sorry. I was in tears. I'm so sorry that he wasn't there. And he says, but you got 28 kids out. And I said, well, yeah. And he said, you know what, Tim, if, if I have to lose my son, so that, if that's what brought you here, your team, and, and if I had to lose my son so that you could help get these 28 kids out, he said, that's a burden I'm, I'm willing to, to bear for the, for the rest of my life.